Uh, this is going to open the meeting uh, for our subcommittee. Um, and I will uh, turn it o over to uh, Sally to go through some of the surveys and analysis of uh, our efforts at distance learning, te um, telework and distance learning, all the buzzwords, see where we are, some of the um, feedback that we've gotten, and I hope some of you've reviewed that. I found it very interesting. Obviously, we can talk a little bit about that as we move forward, but I'll leave it up to Sally, and I'll, and I'll urge everyone uh, to mute themselves if you can uh, so that uh, you don't hear the clattering in my living room as well as anyone else's. Thanks. Go ahead, Sally. Great. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Um, so I'm going to uh, provide a short overview of our staff and a, a brief overview of our family survey, which is kind of a combination of all schools. Um, but I really want to spend most of today's meeting uh, having you hear from our teachers um, that are on the line today from all three levels to really talk about some essential questions related to instruction um, and the methods they're using to engage their students in creative and innovative ways in the, um, I want to say in the classroom, but in distance learning through Google Meets and um, through educational opportunities. So um, I know Mr. Emmett at the board meeting had provided a, a brief overview of the survey data. So I'm going to start with the staff survey data. Um, I did share with you what we've shared with staff, um, but I'm gonna kind of highlight a few topics just orally, um, and then just talk to a few talking points to the staff, um, sorry, the family um, survey also. So we had a tremendous response rate. Uh, we had over 362 um, staff uh, members respond, which is incredible giving um, us feedback. Um, in general, we have about 95% of our staff doing okay or making the best of a difficult situation. Um, that, those answers, I'm sure, would change weekly as different family and situations change, but in general, our staff uh, was in a good place when we administered this several weeks ago. Um, however, it's you know, no surprise to anybody, about 35% of our staff for 20, 126 responses that our staff are concerned about somewhat or quite or extremely concerned about their social emotional being with quarantine, um, COVID, uh, different stressors that we're seeing knowing with our staff and our students. And even higher, 41% uh, of our staff are really concerned about their physical health or well being. So, again, just under 50% of our staff have some concerns. Um, so, as we have moved forward with distance learning and looked at as an organizational decisions, um, we want to be able to provide flexibilities. We want to provide high, um, uh, high quality opportunities for our students to learn, but balancing that with uh, stressors both within our community, our houses, um, and with our staff. Um, about 50% of our staff don't have really significant barriers to work. Um, those that identified some barriers, um, no surprise to all you parents, 23% uh, had childcare, you know, working at home with children at home. 17% um, lack of quiet, quiet workspace, and some of those would also be, I'm sure, um, with um, children or other family members. Um, so those are kind of the two largest barriers we see in our staff survey. We have a high collaboration rate, um, which I think it speaks to that collaboration that occurs in the building continues when we went distance um, and people are finding ways to collaborate with each other. 85% of our staff um, are frequently communicating all the time. Um, we have 69% um, uh, of our staff are really extremely quiet or somewhat confident that they can meet the learning needs of their students during distance learning. Um, and I really, that speaks to the dedication and the drive of our staff members to really truly try and figure this out and through trial and error. Um, none of us were trained in distance learning, um, but through a lot of dedication and desire to do what's best for students, um, we have a high percentage of uh, staff that really feel like they are meeting student needs and so that's wonderful to hear. Um, our parent and family surveys, uh, we're not collated as a district, so I don't have um, specific district data, but I'm going to share with you some general trends across schools. Again, we also saw an incredibly high response rate from our families and parents, so we thank them for that. Um, schools varied anywhere from probably 5 to 15 percent of families identifying they're not doing well or they have sick family members. So a higher incidence of stressor and um, families um, you know, it's kind of struggling during some of the stressors of COVID. Um, a majority of our students are spending close to the target time on work, um, which we provided a range of two to four hours with four hours being the target for most grades. So majority of our students and teachers are working within that. 
Um, we have some students that are working more, and we have some students working less. And when we look at the students and the amount of time students are working, and we look at parent responses, some parents' uh, va opinions varied. And so it really is individualized by students. Somebody could be working more than five hours and they felt like it wasn't enough, or some people thought it was too much and vice versa. Uh, but I think that our target that we set to make it try and be reasonable for students, um, a feedback was very positive. Um, so some struggles we have for our families, um, both in our family and our staff survey, we had uh, reports around too much screen time. Um, we've shared some articles on research of a lot of Zoom meetings or video conferencing meetings, the effect on brain and fatigue and just the, the uh, psychological effects of our brain working through Google conferencing is really fascinating. Um, and also from our families, no surprise, uh, really tough to work uh, work while trying to educate your, your students at home. So we now have families that are teacher, um, cafeteria worker, uh, custodian, and teacher, and doing all of that while trying to work at home with many times multiple children on multiple platforms across varying grades for some families. Um, and comes with that, the next uh, most common comment back um, for their struggles is really trying to stay organized, being in quarantine, being in the house, and trying to keep, maintain and manage your schedules between the adults and the children. Um, overall, there was very positive feedback, overwhelmingly positive feedback on the amount of communication, both from teachers at the school level and the district level, um, was very positive on uh, having appropriate amount of communication. So those are some highlights uh, to our survey data. Are there any specific questions that I might be able to answer for, from board members? If not, I'm gonna move on to the best part of our presentation. Okay, so I wanna just kind of introduce um, uh, what I've asked the teachers to share today um, and given them an opportunity. Um, I've told them again that you're a very friendly group and this is an informal group and we really wanna hear some stories and. Um, paint a picture about really what's happening in all those households now, not even in your classrooms, households around learning. Um, so I uh, framed their thinking around four essential questions, um, just to guide their thinking, but I'm sure they'll, they'll share some really powerful stories with you. So last meeting was a little bit more about like what is distance learning and what's different now. Um, this meeting is really more about the curriculum and instructional focus. So you might hear about some practices that they're using to effectively gauge their learners. Um, what does it look like to be a learner within their, their classroom? Um, ask them to share maybe a way um, how they might design instruction and incorporate cl student collaboration um, during distance learning. How they might use inquiry-based approach or project-based approach during distance learning. And how do we increase motivation and engagement in distance learning, especially after the fact that we just had a recent announcement that we'll be in distance learning until on the last day of school. So the teachers today will not answer all four of those questions, or maybe some might. Um, they might spend more time on some of those questions, but just as to guide some of our conversation, it's really about engagement and instructional strategies, uh, but more importantly, some, some really important stories of what's happening with you and your students um, and how you're making some of this um, incredibly complicated situation become very effective um, and again we saw that in our family surveys with a lot of positive feedback for the work our um, administrators teachers and our staff are doing to support student learning from all levels so with that said i am um, i think last time it worked really well logistically um, if board members could to hold off your questions to the end scribble a little note and we can um, have some questions at the end um, but I think it's probably easier in this format to kind of go through some teacher presentations. We're going to about every eight or 10 minutes um, switch to a new teacher. Um, last time we made elementary way to the end. So elementary is lucky to start. And Emily, you are that lucky person to start us off today. Um, so if you could uh, go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit about your role and I'll uh, mute my microphone and turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Awesome, welcome to my classroom. I'm Emily Caravella, instrumental music teacher at Emerson Williams Elementary. Um, I teach fourth to sixth grade band and orchestra. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak tonight and for all you're all doing to support WPS at this time. I am beyond proud of my students. I couldn't imagine even in college suddenly enrolling in all of my classes online. I'm beyond proud of their parents for continuing to support them through this process and massive life changes. 
And I'm also beyond proud of my colleagues. This is what we do. We figure out, even in the worst of times, how to do our best for our students. Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined going from seeing my students go wide-eyed when they see a snowflake, instantly dreaming of Mr. Emmett saying the words early dismissal or snow day, to waking up to a pile of emails, making sure our Kahoot game Google Meet Fridays are still on because we just got a day off. Thanks, by the way. And it's still on if anybody wants to join us, just email. This is not to say the journey has been easy at all. There continues to be a ton of frustration and scary moments, countless sleepless nights, computer and Wi-Fi issues, and headaches from too much screen time. We have learned so much so fast. Students needed to learn how to navigate Google Classroom, website sign-ins, Google Meet, translate, and even just how to check a million emails daily. We continue to learn what they need and how best to teach them remotely, but I'm here tonight to speak to you about the areas we have found success and let you know about the accomplishments of our amazing students as we continue distance learning. This is a time where educators have been able to reflect on what truly matters in their classroom, but more importantly than the instruction, it's a time to work on connection. The things that make students engaged and excited to learn have not changed during distance learning. In fact, my online classroom and in-person classroom is honestly the same amount of organized chaos and cuteness. <laughs> in person, I arm 172 excited students with loud instruments. And in my digital classroom, I stare at them on my computer screen with unmuted mics, holding up pets and toys and stuffed animals and even walking with their Chromebook so it looks like that when I'm talking to them. I am not sure any teacher prep program could have ever prepared anyone for what it looks like to run Google Meets with elementary schoolers. One of the biggest questions I'm sure you're looking for me to answer tonight is exactly how are the students learning? My students use Flipgrid each week, actually thanks to Jacob Bocek at Webb who took the time to teach me week one. Um, the amount of collaboration between just the music department and even just all of the staff in general has just been amazing. Um, anyway, Flipgrid is a website that allows educators to put up lesson videos and for students to send back video responses on a secure website. Using this process for instrumental music, students get to work on choosing their own music literature to prevent, uh, present. They actually have access to all of their pieces on their Chromebook, thanks to their district provided smart music accounts. That's an interactive program that all fourth to 12th grade students have access to. They also get to work on performing solo and leaving feedback for one another, introducing themselves and their pieces before they play, and even video editing. I have a student who makes his flip grids all in movie styles. Last week, they played the Ghostbusters theme song, and they made a ghost emoji fly across the screen while they're playing. Until the end, they kicked it off the screen with their drumstick. It's pretty cool. Students are also using the website called flat.io to create their own musical compositions. They write them down and share it with each other. This has been one of our favorite new tools. Flat actually exports to smart music as well, so the students could literally write their own pieces and then look at it on smart music, which would tell them how to play it on their instruments. Flat can also be used on Flipgrid. So my students have figured out how to share their composition recordings and music notation using screen share. The first one of my students that did this um, or sorry, the first time one of my students did this, they shared their composition and another student sent them a video of them listening to the piece and telling them how much they enjoyed it in real time. The composer student sent back a video saying, and I quote, thank you for taking the time to record your reaction to my music. Artists don't usually get to see that. It's made me so happy that I'm jumping up and down that it made you as happy as it made me. That's what I wanted when I wrote it. The students then decided they would record reactions to each other's creations from the moment, that moment on so they could see how their art is making their audience feel. I'll repeat that. Fifth graders decided to start talking about how their art was making their audience feel. To date, we have 64 original student compositions on Flipgrid. They literally do this on top of the assignments they have for this week. None of that is actually assigned. And speaking of assignments, we've actually logged over 220 hours of musical performance on Flipgrid at Emerson since DLP began. It's probably a good thing we're practicing social distancing so they don't have to see their proud teacher tearing up over how amazing they are every time they submit a video. 
May is the time of year for our famous instrument petting zoos for third graders. This recruitment event that both, um, this is a recruitment event that both third graders and current instrumental students look forward to each year. The older kids get to help the younger kids learn about the instruments and hear them in a special student led concert. And the third graders not only get to experience the magic of playing an instrument, but they're officially welcomed into our band and orchestra family. Distance did not stop this from happening. My students helped me create the demo concert online. They interviewed themselves, chose pieces that would engage the third graders, and recorded their performances using their Chromebooks. In addition, I went on Google Meet with all the third graders and my amazing general music colleague, Katie Fortuna, and we taught the third graders how to try out their instruments at home using household items. We did things like grab a bottle and try to make the sound that a flute head joint makes, or holding pencils for bow holds, and even buzzing um, your trumpets, um, and how to play brass instruments. Since virtual ensembles are pretty tough to put together and demand very exact musical accuracy to record, Emerson alumni and Emerson teachers, Ms. Fortuna, Mrs. Cookson in grade four, and Mrs. Woods in grade five, took the time to help us record Eye of the Tiger so the third graders could hear what all of the instruments sounded like together. I can't even begin to tell you how grateful and impressed I am that current students, former students, and our amazing teachers who are all in distance learning chaos took the time to create something amazing for our third graders. It's strange writing a conclusion to something that feels never ending. We still have a ton of work to do in terms of distance learning, but we will be forever changed, hopefully for the better, when we return to school. All of the websites and resources I spoke about, I would like to continue in my teaching even when we get back into the physical classroom. My students are learning skills I've never dreamed of, like elementary schoolers, tuning their own instruments and replacing strings on Google Meet and taking what it means like what it means to be a musician to the next level by sharing their amazing performances and compositions so confidently. As we continue DLP into June, I understand that I need to step up the magic to keep my students motivated. I've upped the amount of choice within our lessons each week with options to continue to grow musically both on and off of our instruments. We are continuing to build our connections through our music making and Kahoot game meets. Everything we are working on will make us stronger musicians and citizens when we are able to see each other again. So that's a little look into my online classroom. Thanks for listening and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have at the end. Emily? That was great, thank you. That was unbelievable, but I do have a question to ask you. If, if continues into September, you know, I'm so fearful of it. If it continues into September, this face-to-face -face, um, getting to know students, how do you see that happening? Um, and especially since you have, what, 147, did you say? I have 172 okay. students currently. Um, I also teach chamber orchestra at SDMS, so there's a little more than that. Um, I'm not too worried. I have already made a lot of connections with grade three just throughout the year. I work really hard to invite them in my classroom either to do a ukulele thing or just to say hi. Um, and I've actually already been meeting with third graders on Google Meet right now. I met with every single third grader class and I've had individual meets to talk about which instruments they want or just help them make instrument sounds at home because they seem to like it and it doesn't seem to drive their parents too crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds reassuring, thank you. Yeah. Great, uh, Dee Dee, I'll turn it over to you. Hello everyone. Thank you for hosting the meeting and inviting me into chat tonight. Um, my name is Dee Dee Mahoney. I'm a grade five teacher at Charles Wright Elementary School. Um, I'm honored and excited to talk to you tonight about distance learning. Um, if you would have asked me this question on March 22nd, my reaction might have been a little bit different <laughs> because that's when my head was trying to not explode. Um, I tried to find a really good approach to setting up my classroom because though we use technology in this grade um, reasonably well, not the, the flux of what we do. I'm gonna turn my mic down a little bit. Um, and so I, I was a little concerned about how students would navigate. One thing I knew was that I needed to focus on some really specific things to make this thing fly. So I focused on four things. I focused on structure, communication, curriculum, 
and the one thing that people thought I was crazy for evolution because whatever I did I knew it was never going to be as good as it could be and I needed to be willing to change um, pretty much on the fly. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the structure. Initially I was concerned about how students were responding away from school to the uncertainty that was affecting their lives everywhere. How weird is it to be at school at home with your mom and dad working down the hall? Like everything was upside down. Um, but I did know that structure would provide something for them that was very certain, something they could count on in their life while everything else was a little bit crazy. And I used the district's um, distance learning plan for my guidance and kind of built around that. Um, I designed my Google Classroom page to be very similar to my on the ground classroom. Um, and I based a daily schedule for learning that was similar to the one I used at school. Um, to focus on communication, I focused on a couple of different things. First of all, on the Google Classroom platform, I focused on stream. Um, while lessons posted in the classwork section, everything else posted in screen, in stream, excuse me. It was difficult in the beginning to verbally connect with kids one-on-one -on -one because there was so much technology happening and so many glitches and kids who, as Emily said, didn't understand logins and platforms and, you know, new passwords, um, that all the communication took place in the stream. The stream was important because Every time something happens in the stream, I get a post that says your stream updated, which meant that it cued me to immediately respond to student challenges, which left them not feeling unsafe and unsure, but left them feeling supported and okay that we'd be able to figure it out. They saw me fail. They heard me apologize. They saw me type lessons that said, I don't know, it's in cyberspace and it must have taken a longer route to get to you because I sent it 20 minutes ago. I don't know where it is. Um, so stream was really important. Um, I, then I introduced from stream, I introduced um, meetings through Google Meet and I did it through messages on Google Classroom. I would post something in the stream and say, if you're available, click this link and join me in Google Meet. So kids hadn't been exposed to it. It was a nice way to connect. And it was all very exciting and kids faces would pop up and then they'd go away and then their microphones would go on and then they'd go off just while they played and that was okay i needed them to understand that it was a good platform and little by little then we started to set protocols in place when you're on a google meet your face needs to be visible that's why we do google meet because we need to see each other when you're on google meet your microphone needs to be muted because as cute as your dog is I don't want to hear them bark through the entire lesson. And kids have been really, really great. Once they got used to Google Meet, I knew that I needed to up my game with communication. So I went about setting up small groups. I divided my classroom, I have 19 students, into four small groups. I meet with each of those groups twice a week. I meet with two groups on Monday and Wednesday. I meet with the other two groups on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, it is a check-in time. Initially, it was check-in, like, what do you need help with? Are you having any tech issues? What part didn't you understand? And then it became small group focused. Through my daily exit slips, I would ask questions like, what would you like to work on during our weekly Google Meet? And kids would respond. And whatever majority was, was what we did. So if it was a mini math lesson, great. If they wanted me to do a demo for reading or writing, that was fine too. So those um, lessons have evolved. What I kept thinking was important was getting the kids to connect to each other, and it certainly is hugely valuable. What I learned that was very touching was that what they really wanted was me. So then I went about expanding my communication to set up one-to-one -one meetings with students. I have about nine or ten one-to-one -one meetings with students throughout the week. Um, some students I meet with four days a week. Some students I meet with once a week. Some students log on 15 minutes early to their small group meeting just to tell me about the temperature in their swimming pool, <laughs> but they just want me all to themselves, and that's okay. I need them as much as they need me. And then finally, um, one of the things that I launched very early on was this idea of Freedom Friday. Um, I love technology. I'm sitting here with a watch, a phone. I'm reading my notes off a tablet while I look at you on my laptop. Um, but that said, even in my own house, we don't have technology pretty much downstairs. Um, so 
I got very eye tired. I have new glasses for the screen and I got really tired of everything I did was typed. And I knew that screen time was really, really bad. And I, and I, and I'm not a proponent of video games because of all of the, the research that I've read about it. So I came up with this idea of Freedom Friday, which is a day where all of the curriculum based um, activities that students are given are done away from computer screens. Um, one example is walk through the neighborhood and note three things that you find beautiful, write a poem about them. One of them might be um, a, a popular one that I took off one week and the backlash was horrific and now it's on as a Friday favorite is go cook or bake something with your family. I put it on because we were working on a fraction unit and I thought if the kids could take a recipe and double it, they'd be doing math while they were doing something cool for their families. I get pictures every week of baked goods that I wish they would send me instead of just sending pictures. Um, and I have a really, uh, I have one young man who is a fabulous soup maker. He's very creative. So that really paid off. The Freedom Friday introduction was done through a whole class Google Meet, which was absolutely a disastrous joy. Um, too many microphones on, too many kids going, oh, I haven't seen him. Oh my gosh, how are you? But it was like 20 minutes of utter chaos to end my Friday that I would not change for anything. And it is now a regular part of my weekly classroom. And then the other thing that I did, which um, Emily mentioned the kids checking millions of emails is that kids don't check email. <laughs> I find like I check email a thousand times a day, kids don't. So we've now moved from um, posts in the stream for everything like, you know, my screen is blue today to what can you send in an email that's not urgent or what do you need more comments on that I can be more thoughtful about in an email versus what do you need help with right now, which goes in the stream. So we've expanded student communication. What was crazy to me is that I thought email was pretty self-explanatory until I started getting emails where the entire text of the email was in the subject line. So it was, Mrs. Mahoney, I didn't understand the math lesson 11.4 and I was having trouble with it. And I was like, oh my gosh. So we did some email training as well. Um, so the communication, I think, is a lot stronger. Kids also now talk to each other in our small groups, so they support each other. Tell me what you worked on in your writing. How can I help you with that? Um, so I talked about my structure and I talked about communication. My next step was the curriculum. Um, there are a lot of super smart people who put a lot of really great stuff together, and I hope that um, I'm always smart enough to rely on the work that they've done. So I use the pacing recommendations that I learned about through Google Meets with our curriculum specialists, um, following the changes that were made and adjustments were, that were made for the fact that one, our class sessions were half as long as normal because everything's a half an hour. And two, we missed a couple of weeks. So I use that work as my um, framework for building out my curriculum. My initial um, week or two was really based on finishing up things that were in process when we left on the ground schooling. Um, I tried to make the work look as familiar as possible by using things that we normally did. For example, we post when we read. We have online post-it notes so kids can post and I can see their work and they can still get feedback. Um, I do want to say that the curriculum specialists have been amazing because part of the issue with doing what teachers are trying to do is there are so many um, resources, we can't possibly get through them all. And there's not time for us to find and mine all the cool things we want. And the curriculum specialist was kind of divvied up that work and created little homes for us to go to and pull stuff from. So I've used a lot of that work to kind of help out. One of the important things about um, establishing the curriculum was anticipating the challenges that kids were gonna face and finding ways to work around them. Um, things like Think Central, everything in our math program was online, which is great, except the videos are really long. And when you only have a half hour math period, you can't really move through the curriculum. So we had to find a way to solve that. Um, in reading and writing, our mini lessons, even when they were tight, didn't really give you a lot of time for demo lessons and things like that and still give kids work time. So we had to kind of work through that. Science, you want to assign an investigation, but you don't know what materials kids have at home, which made it a little bit harder. So I've identified those challenges and kind of planned around it. 
And as I've gone through, I've tried to expand the value of different things that we do. For example, I use read aloud to teach word work. We study the vocabulary in the book we're reading as opposed to doing a sit and spelling lesson. Um, we use read aloud to help cushion some of the other reading lessons that we couldn't otherwise get to. And I, collab I put a collaborative effort together to do social studies through reading and writing, or you could say reading and writing through social studies, and it all worked together where kids posted by note taking and social studies use that work to talk about the different types of text they access, like videos, articles, books, um, amazing things that they chose, and then um, just uh, shared that information in writing. And I gave them the option, what do you want to do? So part of their writing piece from our social studies unit was a written essay, which I needed for informational purposes, and the rest of it they decided to do on Google Slides. So to make it collaborative, students prepared presentations on some famous person from American history. And I've done something similar in my classroom and I didn't know how to make it play out. So what the kids decided they wanted to do was that everybody's going to do their presentations dressed in costume and videotape them and send them to me. And we we're gonna make a class movie to teach the American Revolution through kids who are actually acting like people from back in the 1700s. Um, I know my time is wrapping up. One thing I do want to say is that the one definite thing um, that has come out of all of this is that everything I do has become very student driven. Um, when I try something new, the kids are the people that I go to to find out if I should keep doing it. If I try something um, as kind of a quick fix, I gauge their reaction. I went from reading aloud and recording my voice to doing read alouds by video. Now I've invited in a guest reader that shares the text on the screen. The kids came to me immediately and said, we'd rather it be you. Darn it. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, we went from writing journal entries about our reading to doing online post-its. And now we're doing online um, book clubs where kids are meeting to discuss text that way. They've given me the feedback. They've driven my instruction. They've, and because of that, that's why they're engaged. They know that they have a voice in how things look and how things go. And my focus now is in trying to figure out how to keep them engaged to the end, but still provide that end of fifth grade experience that we would have had in the classroom in a way that makes fifth grade memorable for something other than the fact that they got sent home in March and never got to come back to school. But it's been a joy. And I tell them all the time how proud I am of all the things they've overcome and all the challenges that they've figured out how to navigate their way through, um, really they've been rock stars. Great, thank you, Dee Dee, that was great. Uh, Christine? Hi everyone, I'm Christina Gallucci and I'm a first grade teacher at Hanmer Elementary. Uh, thank you for having me tonight to discuss distance learning. Um, as we mentioned, Thinking about what distance learning would look like, especially in a first grade classroom with 16 six year olds. Um, I was, to say the least, very overwhelmed at first. Um, but I have to say it has been a pleasant experience thus far. Um, I've had immense participation uh, with the students and their parents. Their parents have been rock stars, um, you know, being going from parent to educator uh, overnight was certainly um, no easy task. So I just wanted to go ahead and discuss what the instructional practice looks like in first grade uh, over distance learning. The first two weeks, I took the time to review strategies that we've learned over the year and just solidify and ease my students into what distance learning would look like now that they were at home with their parents um, and in their pajamas. So uh, I wanted to certainly um, allow for an easy transition for them. My team and I um, have divided the subject areas and divided and conquered because we are teaching uh, every single subject. And so it has helped tremendously um, I am personally responsible for developing reading and math lessons to deliver to um, all of our students in grade one. Following the first two weeks, we moved into new learning 
and based on where we left off with our units of study. So we were able to easily pick up with where we left off. Um, each new lesson that we present does offer a taped lesson that we, we record. So that has really helped. The feedback on that has been amazing from parents. Um, the videos uh, have what's expected for the day's teaching point along with the tasks that the students will complete. We do stagger lessons to reduce the stress that comes with five subject areas on top of what the unified arts teachers uh, would like for the students to do as well. And so um, my team and I do our best to limit screen time as well. That has certainly been uh, something that we work hard on. We don't want our students uh, in front of a computer screen. So uh, the taped lessons allow them to understand what they're gonna be doing for the day. And then we have a task uh, for them to complete um, for each subject area. As far as how I deliver my instruction, I looked into various platforms, um, but I found that a daily email organized with a template that I created has worked best. Prior to distance learning, I constantly emailed my parents to always inform them of what was happening. And so my parents were very familiar with that format. And so um, I send out a daily email every morning with the attachments for what the students need to complete. And the parents, at the end of the day, I ask for them to send a end of day review, just letting me know what their child has completed and they're able to upload uh, attachments for me to be able to see. And it's worked out really great. Um, it allows me for also to keep track of engagement. And so um, email has just been a great way for me to present distance learning to, um, to my students. Um, I've also offered, and a lot of parents have taken me up on one-to-one -one Google Meet sessions with their child, um, which has been extremely beneficial. Um, it's, it's been hard because some parents just have a really hard time, you know, presenting the material and teaching it to their child. So I've gotten a lot of uh, requests to have one-to-one -one sessions um, where I'm able to really just to have that personal connection with the child and still present the teaching point to them. Um, so I'm happy to say that that's been really helpful for everyone. Um, skills that my students are learning, uh, my team and I have continued to teach the teaching points with regards to the units of study. So we really haven't wavered from that. We've truly been able to um, continue with the curriculum, which has been wonderful. And although we may not present every aspect of the lesson, our students truly are getting the main focus of, of each lesson. Um, I'm happy to say that we've also been able to continue with our Go Math curriculum, science and social studies, as well as our um, SEL curriculum. And the, as I mentioned earlier, the parents have been awesome with delivering the curriculum, de delivering the teaching points and the tasks that we have set up for students. So it's, it's been great to see that. Um, one of the projects that we did, and I wasn't sure how this would pan out over distance learning, over virtual learning, um, but when we ended in March, when we left, we were in the middle of our uh, word builder um, unit in phonics. And one of the creative activities that we do at the end is for each child to create a vowel town, utilizing um, up to 20 places that and uh, 20 places that are labeled, such as school, the creamery, uh, train track, um, utilizing all the vowel uh, teams and word work that we worked so hard to learn. Um, and I was happy to say that every student was able to create their very own vowel town and send me pictures. And I created a PowerPoint presentation to share out with all the families so that their, the child could see their peers work and still be able to share out um, all the hard work. Uh, so many of my parents would say that their kids would literally wake up and run to the project. They just thoroughly enjoyed still being able to, um, to complete it. So that was still very exciting um, to be able to do that. In fact, one of my students created Vowel Town using Legos, 
which she wouldn't have been able to do had we been in the classroom. So um, it was just very um, interesting to see how creative they were at home with what they had. Feedback that we've received in first grade, it's primarily um, through parents, um, but my team and I sent out a survey after the first month. We wanted to really just check in with families and continue to see what technology was still available, how the assignments were going for families, and if there were any changes um, in the home. Um, per their feedback um, and one-to-one -one phone calls and emails that I've had with parents, we did find that at first sending new lessons every day um, was a bit overwhelming for parents. So that's what allowed us to kind of, um, kind of just revamp how we were presenting our information. So we went and um, presented it through a staggered approach. So for example, on Mondays, I present a new reading and math lesson and writing and phonics are a review of the previous day. And then we just alter, um, alternate um, Monday through, through Friday, uh, through Thursday rather. Um, science and social studies, uh, we have decided to go about doing a week long assignment. And so students are given three to four different activities to demonstrate their learning. So activities can include writing, drawing, uh, creating something very hands on. And they're asked to choose, uh, to choose two activities to complete for the week. Um, and then of course on Fridays, we thought it was super important to have screen free Fridays. And so many of the activities are not screen related. Um, it could be anywhere from go outside and take a nature walk, uh, to building a fort and read, um, to having a dance party. So we just have received such great feedback from that as well. Um, and parents are very appreciative of having a day off, if you will. Um, and so Lastly, some of the strategies that I've used in first grade to motivate my students, um, the daily feedback that I provide both to students and uh, parents through that end of day review, I can you know, personalize my feedback, um, really offer um, feedback for them to continue to grow. And um, I'm just so overwhelmed by the, uh, the quality of work that I'm receiving, even though they're so far, which it's just truly been amazing. Um, I do one-to-one -one Google Meet sessions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if a child is not understanding a particular concept, um, and even just chatting for a few minutes. I've had a lot of students, I uh, just had a student the other day personally email me and say how much he misses me and misses the class. Um, so I've been able to just have that one-to-one -one connection with students and still maintain that. Uh, we utilize really fun hands-on activities that they're, they're loving. Um, I still wanna keep it fun and exciting for them. And the last thing that I do is every week we do snack time. So uh, 16 uh, six-year-olds on Google Meet is very interesting. <laughs> Luckily, I have the power to mute. <laughs> so, um, you know, I see their dog, they want to show their playroom. Um, same thing as uh, was mentioned earlier, the camera's constantly bopping up and down, but it's just been a great way to keep everyone connected. Um, you know, at six years old, it's really hard for them to understand why we're home. And um, so I'm just trying to keep as much normalcy as possible. Our day truly does follow the same schedule that we would as it did um, when we were in the classroom. And so parents have said that, you know, their kids are telling them what to do next as far as our schedule. So, um, you know, it's been interesting. And uh, I'm happy to say that over, although it's overwhelming um, and the emails and, you know, making sure that I'm responding to everyone, I have to say, um, it's been it's been a great experience considering the situation that we're in. Christina, thank you for sharing. That was great. Uh, you guys are really, you know, we're halfway through the list, but so many amazing examples of above and beyond and just uh, ways you've engaged your students. Um, Kim, I'm going to turn it over to you.
try uh, bottom left, click on the screen and you see, there you go. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you everybody for having me as well. Um, you are actually experiencing a perfect example of what my online days are like. I don't know if you noticed, but I've been throwing wheat thins to the, to the dog to keep her quiet because she was barking at me. <laughs> and I've learned that she'll chase them and come back and I can keep doing my teaching. She's currently outside. Had the letter out, so I apologize for the distraction of getting up and back down. I have to keep an eye on her because yesterday about this time a bear came through the yard and um, we're just doubling all the plates as we go. Um, I am a special ed teacher at Webb and I consider myself very lucky to be a special ed teacher at Webb. Um, I kind of thought to, about speaking tonight and explaining my days and kind of was a little concerned that when I think of my days, they're a little bit low tech compared to others. Um, I do spend a lot of time on Google Meets, which is a high tech piece. However, I really found that my special ed kids really wouldn't be successful with me pushing that out into them, that I really needed to be with them. So my day really consists of from 9 o'clock to 11.45, or 11.30, half hour Google Meets with a different kid each half hour. I then go into a Google Meet most of the days from 11.45 to 1 with a particular student has a higher number of hours that he receives. And then I finish the day with a 45 minute session. Um, I really do find that the structure, both for me and for them, has been very helpful. I was very fortunate in several ways to be able to, or I'm very fortunate, to have been able to structure my schedule so that my kids are really getting exactly the amount of time that they were getting when we were in school. Um, and there's a couple of reasons that that was possible. And one of them is the fact that the district made the decision to keep our paraprofessionals. I, they have really been super helpful in um, helping us to coordinate schedules on with the students that I would have had in a group in school, and I chose not to have a group for confidentiality reasons now that we're out, I was able to have a paraprofessional who would work with the kids, the student in school, and knows them well to be able to really cover um, my time with that student. So the communication between myself and the paraprofessionals that work with my students has been immense. We text each other all day. We, <laughs> we email each other at various times. Um, and then there's a level of communication within between myself and the classroom teachers because I'm a member of three Google Classrooms. I am a at, was added as a teacher in two separate CSOP platforms to be able to track what my students are doing in their regular classroom in addition to being able to service their special ed goals that are individualized to them. So my planning looks a little different in the fact that I'm able to plan individually for each kit, each student, which is awesome. Um, but I also have it allowed myself, I guess, to have the flex a little more flexibility to really support them in more of their classroom things. Um, the student that I do spend some time with, some of my time in school with him is um, I work on reading comprehension after I've done some structured literacy lessons with him. And it's been really nice for me to see him, I'm typically in his classroom in, for his reading block, but to see him cross curriculum applying the skills that he's learning in his lesson. So it's really been nice to really ask him each day, we have certain things to work on, but what would you like to work on based on what you've already seen in your classroom assignments and what you want some help on? Um, and being able to offer that support has been helpful. And I talked about, um, or when I thought about the tools and how things were structured, um, again, I thought being face to face was so important. Um, I have learned, I, somebody else mentioned, I think, DD, it was you that. Um, You've watched your students be the experts and things, and it's been really nice to be able to watch them 
say, Miss Keeper, I want to present this to you. Can I present to you? And I said, absolutely, you can present to me because I want to see what you're doing. And they've gotten very creative about how that work happens. Um, as far as technology pieces, I've been lucky to work with our IT department um, and been amazed with what the rate will do. I even to the point where I had lessons for a particular kid that I had written and forgot in my classroom on my, my jump drive in my computer, was able to email the IT department and ask for access to those lessons. And it took uh, it took about a week, but I got every single one of the lessons off a flash that left in my computer at school, which I thought was amazing and oh so helpful. Um, I also consider myself to have been really fortunate to have found a lot of the online professional development things that were offered by a lot of different companies for free that really we would have been paying for, both material pieces and video um, video professional development that I wouldn't have had the time to engage in Um I would say that I'm going to hang on one second because the dog now wants to come in. <laughs> um, but I'll keep talking. I will say that the plan, as far as planning, communication has been humongous. I, I cannot say how much the different layers of communication have been so helpful in closing the themes for different students, it's particularly in the beginning when we talked about what students were engaging, what were not. There were students that maybe I was seeing and the classroom teacher wasn't seeing, or the classroom teacher was seeing and another provider, the speech pathologist, wasn't seeing. So that level of communication really became so, so important and shifts over time. I mean, in this situation, I, we have students that are in different homes, and I have three students that throughout this whole process, back and forth, the, home, the, love, the parents communicating to me on where they were, where should I send a Google Meet? And really having to update each other in those circumstances has been incredible to see. Um, and I would say probably that relationship building has been huge. And I know, Sally, at one point in time early on, um, your words, as I was kind of stressing out about going into all of this, on the very first, I think it was the Friday before we actually started, you had two words of advice. One was to start small, and one was to lead with kindness, compassion, empathy, and that positive relationship. And I would say that positive relationship has done it um, for my kids right now. They really, they really need to see, and a lot of the, their parents have been, I think, very appreciative of the fact that it's not all on them, that we are sharing what needs to be done with our students and that when they are tired and when they need a break, their students can connect with me on the computer and, and they can even leave the room while the first graders and kindergartners are sitting on the computer and really continuing to be engaged in those lessons that they were, that we're working on. Um, I'm trying to think, I took a bunch of notes. I wanted to make sure that I, uh, I am thankful as you are watching with this whole dog situation that I personally at home have much older children. I have a 19-year-old and a 16-year-old, and they're very independent. I have watched some of my colleagues on Google Meets with much younger children, and I can't imagine what those colleagues are managing, what our parents are managing. Um, I also have families that have very young children, uh, a year and a half and two, and it's very distracting to the students while we're on, but in dating even that child and what we're doing um, has been really helpful and really has gone a long way, I think, in the parents feeling as though that factor of we're going to make this work over time. Um, as far as motivation, I think my kids, I think they are really pretty motivated. Um, but I do think I would have to say that face-to-face -face time has been important. And I know they mentioned that even my older students will mention that they, they are encouraged by that from their own classroom teachers, um, that 
is seeing us and knowing that we're there and knowing that they can email us or they can send us a message in whatever format it is, we'll get a response. And a pretty quick one has been has helped, just been nice to know. Nice to know that they, they're feeling that. Um, as far as feedback from parents, I did ask three of my parents today what sort of feedback they might offer um, in such such a discussion. Um, and I think, like the rest of us, the major part of that was they initially felt extremely overwhelmed um, and didn't know where to start. And I think that was the general understanding, both from my parents and from colleagues that I work with. And we've all sorted it out. Like we all knew that we were going to figure it out. They, I will say, parents have felt, or the ones I've spoken to, have felt well informed about the process along the way and have really appreciated the fact that they are well informed and are not left guessing and, and really have some clear communication along, along the path. Um, they've been overwhelmed a little bit by the technology, but I will say that two of the three mentioned that over time with the coordination with the classroom and teacher um, and whoever it is, whoever else is, the occupational therapist, whoever else they're working with, they really felt like they had someone to hold their hand along the way. Um, and I will say there was one particular day where I saw all of my kids on my regular days and blocks, but had 60 text messages and 10 phone calls with a grandparent who, who the student had had to trans transition back to because the mother of the child had been exposed to the um, virus and it was an interesting day but you know what we kept I kept telling her she was going to make it work and it worked <laughs> and that's really been the experience it's it's all working um, I have found some individual tools that have been helpful certainly um, Google Meets has been huge obviously for me but Jamboard became something very an, a very important tool and for the students that I actually have that have a touch screen, it really becomes a whiteboard on your computer. They can actually write right onto their computer. And I teach um, structured literacy and there's a really heavy kinesthetic component to that. And it's been so important to be able to offer that to them. Because they can't really see them right on paper. And if they hold up their paper, it kind of looks like this. And I can't really analyze what they've done, but to be able to save all of their pieces within Jamboard has been incredible. Um, they, they, parents have also mentioned that the teachers that they're engaging with are doing nice short lessons. Um, for example, in their Google Classrooms, posting a short, a mini, what we would call a mini lesson in the classroom, and it's just short enough, just detailed enough that they feel that their students have been able to really go off on their own independently and be able to work on something until they got to the point where they maybe did need the help. I will say that I have at least two parents that are concerned about where their students will be um, when they come back in the fall, where they will be academically. Um, and that's a real reality. And I think having had the experience I've had thus far, I'm not too worried about that because I'm pretty sure we're doing a good job. <laughs> Great, right, Kim. Thank you for sharing, and, and thank you for sharing the realities of life around us <laughs> keeps happening because the dogs you. bark and the kids are yelling or happy or ready to cross the screen. So, so we're going to transition to secondary. I'm going to turn it over to Matt from the middle school. How are you doing, guys? My name is Matt McKinnon, eighth grade social studies at Silene. All right, thank you for having me. You know, tonight, you know, elementary guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. Um, first, I want to say, you know, with this process, you know, we're fortunate we've had great administration about it. You know, the communication from Roslyn and Cindy to us, you know, has really helped us along the way, uh, especially with the support staff, guidance counselors, and you know, reading specialists. They're all involved in our team meetings, helping us with our students, you know, and the team leaders as well, meeting on Fridays and, you know, giving the feedback to our teams. You know, so all that's been great, you know, which which makes it easier. You know, overall, our goal, you know, at the middle school level, and Siobhan's here as well, she'll add in when, when she speaks. But we try to give about 20 to 30 minutes a subject a night, 
you know, so they get to that four hours for all their classes. You know, we try to make it as interesting sorry. and meaningful. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> sorry about that, but she's in now and it'll be quiet. Michael, it looks like her microphone's muted, but I think it's frozen. Sorry about that, Matt. No, no problem. <laughs> All right. Am I good to go? Go ahead. All right. So, uh, you know, so a lot of us already use Google Classroom, you know, within our classes. So it was a smooth transition with uploading sources, you know, with a lot of teachers and being on a team, we would help each other. And we had the technology department, Sarah sent out email. So it was, you know, really nice to see all these different platforms we were able to use. A lot of companies said, hey, use this free the rest of the year. You know, we got some emails on that, you know, and use those in our lessons. So one of the things was designing instruction. So you got to look at it. It's tough. You know, we have push in with, you know, teachers coming in and you have, you know, 26 kids a class, 90 kids overall to, you know, to meet their needs online. You know, so New ZLA was huge, you know, especially in social studies so the students can choose which reading level they want to be at to get the same information and if they needed help we helped them or the reading um, specialist teacher uh what else do i have here uh google docs you know everything through there so the teachers could comment you know write the feedback how do you cite you know put in some suggestions and able to go back and forth with students that way and then uploading a variety of sources you know, some people love learning by listening, you know, so having videos on there with images for them to put picture with words to help the, the EL students that are in there, you know, kind of make that connection. Using different level texts, we like to, vocabulary is always good. You know, people that like music and, you know, maybe keep them more engaged with the lesson, maps. So we try to give them a variety of sources to look at then they can choose from those sources where, where they want to pull their evidence from. So not forcing them to just use one source. Here's a plethora of resources. Choose the one that fits your needs and you know, pick the one and, and do your assignment based off of that. And we would change up the style of the lesson each day you know, for engagement. So we would take sources and say, hey, make a Instagram post and we give like a template of this person, what would they say? What would they hashtag? You try to, you get that engagement. Oh, I'm familiar with this and, you know, have them buy into it more. You know, types of assignments um, that we would use is summarizing from sources. IXL practice through social studies has been phenomenal. Class questions and debates where we'll start a question and then students using the resources will communicate, you know, coming back to answer that question vocabulary terms to help them out, you know, SBAC wise, reading wise, to hit on that, especially with American history. And then writing reaction and thoughts. You know, we promote it all year, you know, take this evidence, you know, make a claim, you know, and support it. And, you know, having them continue that ability to do that was really nice to see and working on those skills that we've taught, you know, through March in person. Skill students are learning, you know, navigate across several sources, this is a bias source. This is a great source, you know, really looking into that, how to use evident writing and the levels for people are all over with how much they can bring in and really use that to you know, prove a claim. Organizational skills with note taking, you know, we um, suggested that you could either type it in the document or still complete it in your notebook with the strategies you were taught, take a picture, screenshot it and upload it into the document. So if they felt comfortable a certain way with just, you know, some people don't like to type everything. So if they felt comfortable with writing, they could take a screenshot. And also learning about how our country evolved, which is very important, you know, social studies. So it is, uh, you know, how, how do we get to where we are today? You know, starting back in the 1700s, you know, with what Sons of Liberty did, founding fathers and all that. You know, I believe that's very important to learn. You know, just give you guys an example of a lesson, you know, like when we introduce westward expansion you know, for social studies and, you know, the, the social studies content teachers, we all were giving the same lessons. So across eighth grade was identical. And we used, you know, vocabulary on Lewis and Clark, New ELA on the Gold Rush, a cartoon video on the, 40, on the 49ers, and students got to use those different resources to create a writing on wondering what more about westward expansion pick one of the topics and where else can you look for this and starting you know the independence um, with them 
Um, and then, you know, the last question there was engagement in, in June. You know, how do we keep them engaged after Memorial Day? The weather is nice. You know, they're on a computer screen time. You know, how we're going to do it is just, you know, keeping a variety of sources, you know, hoping certain ones can the interest of all. You know, we're going to be getting into civil war, you know, where they hear the war word, that you know, they're a little interested even more, to, you know, seeing what happened. You know, keeping the work, you know, at, you know, at that 15, 20 minute range, you know, connecting to real life today as best we can and giving them options how to display their knowledge that's learned. You know, I think that's important. You know, we teach advocating for yourself and be able to, you know, accountable talk, you know, it gives them those options. Okay, I want to show it to you in Google Doc format. I want to, you know, speak into the computer and you can hear it. And, you know, and, and get them ready for high school even more in those last couple of weeks. But that's it. Great, thank you so much. Um, Siobhan, are you there? I am. I'm, I'm going to apologize first for not having my video up. My husband is a healthcare worker, and when he comes home, he strips down in the garage, throws on a bathrobe, and runs through the house to get into the shower. And um, if I'm not outside in the garden doing this, I'm in my bedroom. So I, <laughs> I'm just making sure that there are, are no unnecessary little screen moments that happen. So thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> thank you for that. Not a problem. And on that note, um, I'm Siobhan DeGray. I've been fortunate enough to teach at the middle school for the last 13 years. Um, I grew up in Wethersfield. I lived on Church Street for, for a, a good long while. And um, I've been in Hebron now for a little while. So thank you so much for affording me the opportunity to speak to you this evening about distance learning. Um, First of all, I think I should recognize all the efforts of my elementary and secondary counterparts. I think that overall the Weathersfield teachers have really done a tremendous job launching a completely digital platform um, on a shoestring budget and in very little time. So well done to everyone as we embark on this adventure together. As for what's happening at the middle school specifically, I have to say we're really fortunate because we've been supplementing our in-class um, like our in-person teaching since the very beginning of the school year with a lot of the digital resources that we're currently asking the students to use. So given that they are a little bit older, a little bit more independent, and that they were using things that were familiar to them, we've really been able to provide them with lessons that are pretty easy for them to navigate. Um, we've also been really kind of passionate about making sure that the learning for the middle school students was asynchronous. Middle school learners are very unique. They come with very unique little quirks. Um, some of them are at home right now and they are taking care of little brothers and sisters while mom and dad are at work. Or they're helping their fifth grade sister um, log on to her Google Meet with her teacher. Or you know, they're, they're doing a lot of different things at home that perhaps some of the younger students um, aren't necessarily doing during the day on top of their studies or they're sleeping until three o'clock in the afternoon like a lot of my students report to me every day and then they're up at night because you know mom and dad are working and, and there's no one home to, to wake them up so um, we tried really hard to make sure that all of the lesson materials were available for students in whatever manner they wanted to be able to access them at a time that they were able to access them so if I post a lesson, um, it's usually got, you know, we've been focusing a lot on short stories. I teach language arts in eighth grade. And so we've been teaching a lot of literary analysis through a short story unit. We'll live in a short story for about two weeks. We'll provide them with the auditory version. Um, maybe we'll have like a Simpsons parody, which we have this week with a telltale heart. Perhaps we'll have them, you know, explore a Newzella article that um, is a nonfiction website that we use that deals with a theme that's present in the story. So we really try to get the most out of one resource so that not only is there plenty of time for them to accomplish all of the assignments that we're asking them to do, but they have two weeks in order to meet with teachers um, when they're able to, you know, if they have questions about the content in that story. Um, with 100 students almost, it, it is very difficult to make sure that you are getting face time with all of them. And that's something that's been really important to all of us to try to check in. You know, we meet, like Matt said, we meet as a team weekly to make sure that, you know, everybody has heard from, from someone. Like maybe Jimmy hasn't been doing his language arts homework for the week, but that's not his favorite subject anyway. But I know 
that he's checking in with Tom McLaughlin and he's been working really hard on science. So I know Jimmy's okay and maybe I'll send a quick email to say, hey, I heard you did a great job on that science um, assignment this week. How about this week you, uh, you pay a little attention to Mrs. DeGray and language arts because I miss you too. So we have, we are fortunate enough that we know the kids really well from having been with them for the first few months of the year. And so we're able to hold them accountable in a way that is playful, but also they know that we mean business, which is, you know, the approach that you have to take. For those of you who know middle school age learners, that's kind of our jam, you know, like a lot of tough love. Um, but they know that they know that we mean business when when you know when uh, when the time comes. Um, we've been really lucky to have such access to um, the technology folks. Like I know Sarah is here this evening, and the number of times that I have reached out because a parent is having trouble accessing something, or you know Sally swears that there really was something typed in that Google Doc that all of a sudden disappeared. Like the memes are not lying. The ones that you've been seeing all over Facebook and Instagram, like that's our day. That's we middle. That's a middle schooler every day. Oh, it's in there. I promise I did it. And what you know, what are you going to do from across the the interweb? Like I, I can't look him in the eye and say, "Come on now and use my special secret middle school teacher power that usually works in person." So, um, we've been really lucky that they've been super patient with us because I think Jeff Telke has you know gone to Google and investigated fully about four of those claims for me just last week. Um, but that I mean, those are those are some of the great moments that we're all really in, really enjoying that are you know giving us something to laugh at and and helping us get through some of the things that are a little more stressful. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the really fabulous work that some of the kids are doing that's been really surprising. Like I have a couple of students who really struggled with the traditional school year, um, who have been absolute rock stars now that you know, there are no distractions for them at home with distance learning. Not that I at all want this to be normal or a regular thing for us. I miss my classroom, I miss my students desperately. But that was one nice little silver lining that, you know, th this young man was able to mature a little bit and realize that, you know, without those distractions and without other things going on at, um, around him, he was able to really focus um, and show some real growth in his own learning. And he's super proud of himself, too. So that was really heartwarming to see. Um, we've tried to, you know, with language arts, we have an opportunity to be creative every once in a while. Last week, a few students recorded a um, a Zoom play that they put together for me that was their take on um, a short story called The Hitchhiker. So they recorded it and, and submitted that for it. And that was a lot of fun. We're, we're finding some really great moments to connect as a community. Um, I mean, certainly the academics are there, but, but we're also really, really trying to make sure that the kids see us as people as well. I had a, my largest Google Meet today, which I was really excited about because middle schoolers, it's really hard you can schedule 20 meets a week, but sometimes, you know, A, they don't want to come. Mom doesn't know that it's really available because they're the ones getting the email and so they don't sign up or they get there and then it's like crickets. They don't know how to interact with each other. They're, they get a little nervous and, and it's a little awkward for them. So today I had 17 students and the plan was that we were going to talk about um, the book that they have to read that's required for the high school next year. They're all going to ninth grade honors at the high school at Wethersfield High School next year. And they have to read a book called Mythology by Edith Hamilton. And they were all really excited to start this book group with me today. And, and they're reading the first chapter and, and we're talking about different themes. And it was just like I took a step back for a moment and looked at my screen. And it was almost like I was back in my classroom for just a minute because I hadn't really experienced that level of discussion and discourse with kids for a few months now because I've had conversations with them in small groups but to see 17 of them on the screen in front of me having a talk about you know literary analysis with a, with a great work of, of literature was just absolutely phenomenal and it, it's probably going to be a moment that helps me get through the next couple of weeks as I know the downward slide is coming because eighth grade itis is tough when you're in the building I, I don't even want to think about what it's going to be in the next few weeks. I think I'm going to have uh, Coach McKinnon come on and like do some daily announcements for my kids with that big booming voice of his just to kind of get him back in line. Um, I don't know. So we will definitely keep you posted on, uh, on how it's going. But we, we appreciate your support. We appreciate the support of the parents. And, you know, obviously all of our administrators have been phenomenal because, like Matt said, we 
we all have families at home as well and, and everybody is just in the same kind of leaky boat trying to figure out how to bail out as much water as we can every day. So thank you again for allowing me to speak tonight. Great, thank you, Siobhan. So uh, we're gonna move to our last two um, speakers. Uh, we'll go to Tom Brown from Augustus High School. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. So um, thank you very much for having me to talk tonight. Um, first thing I wanna do is say uh, thank you guys. I know you're getting information from us, but thank you for uh, the tone that you set with this early on uh, was very helpful uh, to me and my colleagues, I'm sure. Uh, just in terms of setting a very understanding, compassionate approach. And that from the top down allows us to open our hearts towards the students, you know? Uh, and it was, it was a big, uh, it could have been a lot more stressful <laughs> had you guys not been so human about it. So I really do appreciate the tone that administration set with, you know, being forgiving, being compassionate, trying things, building the plane as you're flying it. Uh, all of that allowed us to pass that on to our students. So I appreciate that. Uh, the skills. Uh, so Sally, I'm gonna take uh, your prompts and I just kind of went through like a buffet and I kind of took a bunch of them. So I'm gonna go through a few of them. Skills. Uh, one phrase that I got tired of hearing all the time, just because I've been hearing it since 1988, was 21st century learning. And we're gonna replace that with 2020 skills. Because 2020 in just the last eight weeks has evolved into a whole new skill set that uh, is, it, the skills were there before, but they've been emphasized differently. Um, so for example, uh, students, now need to convince me online that they understand something. And I give them flexibility for that, but they're using the skills, uh, you know, how can you convince somebody that you understand something? So I, I wanted them to understand this thing about static electricity. So I had them go to uh, this, the PHET labs out of the University of uh, Colorado, our amazing resource. Uh, they've been around for years, but they're so much more important right now. Uh, they are little simulations online. And one of them is John Travolta standing on a rug. And you get to move John Travolta's leg back and forth. And then watch as the static electricity builds up and then discharge. And I had the students just do a one-page assignment where they play with that. Go ahead and play. And then prove to me that you understand in your own writing also use one screenshot that you capture from playing the activity. So the kids had everything to choose from and some of them didn't know how to take a screenshot, you know, and some of them were taking pictures of their phone with their camera. And they found all kinds of different ways to do it, but uh, just learning like, here's how to take a screenshot, here's how to crop it, here's how to add it into a document at the right place so that it emphasizes and strengthens your writing. So we're doing all these type of skills where it's them learning how to convince us that they've learned something over the screen and through that way, uh, as opposed to being in person, which is helpful. Uh, and it looks like we might have some more of it <laughs> for a while. Um, so for motivation, um, motivation has been interesting. Like some of the other people had said, I've had some kids who were struggling with traditional school who have become superstars with this. And I'm like, where were you when we were in school? This is amazing, that's great, you know? And then I've had other kids who I wouldn't have picked uh, just shut down. And that has happened. And we end up, you know, we reach out to the parents, we reach out to the, the school counselor and they go back and forth and we're trying to do the best we can with some of that. but. Uh, just as an example, I know you want real practical in the trench examples of what's been going on. Um, a lot of kids would respond to the positive motivationals, uh, sending the supportive message, giving the reminders. Uh, there's so many different options that we can do in Google Classroom where you could, you could look at an assignment and then you can make sure that all the kids get a reminder email 
and that motivates some of them. But we got a directive at one point uh, from, from Tom. He said, uh, go ahead and type in zeros into PowerSchool for the stuff that hadn't been done up to this point. And we're like, okay. So we did that. And for other kids, within two hours after typing in those zeros, I got 36 assignments in after gentle reminders. So some kids are motivated by the positive and the supportive and other kids are motivated by the seeing the grades in, in power school actually appear. Um, some of the feedback we've gotten from, from parents, um, sometimes they're very grateful that we're communicating because we're, we're trying to communicate with them. We go from emails, we're inviting them to participate, we're inviting them to sign up for Google Classroom so that they can see what they can see as parents. Um, sometimes they're like, my kid doesn't know what to do. And then you talk to them and then you invite them. I've called them and talked to them in person and they've been really supportive about uh, things. Um, but what happens sometimes is Nelson Mandela, one of my favorite quotes ever, it seems impossible until it's done. I've had so many cases where somebody's like, I don't know how to do it. And then they, they ace it. And then all of a sudden the assignment's done. And it's, so there's this learning curve that we're on, but there's learning going on on the learning curve, if that makes sense. Um, so I wanna try and share a couple pictures with you just of some stuff. Let's see if this works. Um, let's see, I'll go desktop there. Okay. Can you see what's going on? Okay, there's my screen. All right, so this is where the kid was writing and he added the picture from the lab that he was playing with. And you can see that um, one of the neat things that we've been able to do is with Google Classroom has rapidly evolved since so many people jumped on board with it. There was a, uh, there's something that I believe somebody told me it's a beta that we're actually testing right now as, as the users of plagiarism. So looking for originality, when I look at the kid's paper up in this side, I can see how much of that was copy and pasted from online. And then I can send the kid a response and say, why don't you look and see how much of that looks like you just copied and pasted it from a website instead of putting it into your own words. And once they got there with that, you know, I have a freshman right now at Wethersfield High School. I have a senior at Wethersfield High School. And I also have a sophomore going to be a junior, I feel so old, at the University of Vermont. And so I, I know what the college is gonna be looking for as well. And I also see what different levels in high school are gonna be looking for. So for the freshmen, they can actually use this tool to see how much is being flagged. And we have some talks about, we have some talks about um, using that tool that checks for plagiarism to make your writing even more original which is something that people in college have to do. Uh, I know my wife first started getting it when she went back to school to become a nurse. If your paper has more than 10% uh, flagged, you have to rewrite it. Even if you were locked in a room by yourself, not online, if it comes up as somewhere. So the, the new world of having things searchable like that means that you could come up with something that somebody wrote somewhere else and as unfair as it seems you might have to change it and this is kind of like kids being able to look at that tool themselves and saying to themselves now oh five percent of my paper is flagged that's an acceptable level or saying oh thirty percent's flagged that's too high a level that's not acceptable um so just for in terms of writing there's a lot of new tools that we've been trying to introduce them to, and that's one of the skills uh, and examples of the work. Um, trying to get, here's another one. So this particular one was just, this was a kid taking a screenshot. And you know, just 
teaching them how to take better screenshots, teaching them how to communicate better. This kid took a picture using his phone of his computer screen. And it's like, you could do that with two keys. And <laughs> here's a little tutorial. So we're filling in a lot of technological gaps as we go with this. We've discovered a lot of kids who are so savvy on TikTok and social media need a lot of basic instruction when it comes to like, how do you make your paper look smooth? How do you make this? How do you use this towards your advantage? Um, and then getting them out of the classroom too. This was just, I had to put this as an optional assignment. This was kind of early on. Uh, I figured everybody has a driveway or a sidewalk that they had access to. You know, go out and do a diagram on your driveway. So this is a diagram of the rock cycle that they did on the driveway. Um, just as a bonus activity to get them outside and thinking about it and producing the work in a different way. Um, so that is, let's see if I can stop sharing. All right. Nope, I cannot stop sharing. <laughs> there we go. Stop sharing. There we are. Okay. So, so I guess what I want to leave you with the most is um, just this, it almost seems uh, paradoxical but these are the two biggest things that have struck me, uh, is the importance of providing the structure for the students is what we need to do um, at the high school within the framework of providing that flexibility for whatever is going on in their lives. So we started this very much, do what you can do. And as we move forward that uh, providing that structure is very important. We did the asynchronous learning, which is great. You know, we had to do that in the beginning to make this work. And, and I applaud you guys for taking that hard choice, but having as much structure as possible is what a lot of the students that I deal with uh, need. So I'm trying to build in as much structure within the flexibility as possible. So. We need to keep that flexibility for the kids who need it, but we also need to provide lots of structure as we move forward. And then um, the second thing is, you know, the overall goal for our students is to uh, make independent learners. And that has really been great for this, but they need tons of support to become independent learners. So uh, I know that seems paradoxical too. You know, you want support, but you want flexibility. You want to provide lots of support, but you want them to be independent. The, but these are, these are the truths of, of what I've been trying to do. Uh, and that's what I've been struggling with. And like the other teachers, I am also blown away by how much I was able to get them to do just by being in their face. <laughs> I just, I had no idea that I was so good a life coach with life and stuff just by being there. I mean, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought that I could? So yeah, so I've tried to have more office hour meetups with the asynchronous is to just have myself on mute in a meetup. And as soon as a kid starts playing, I say, play some music, make some noise, rattle, make your dog bark, whatever, and I'll come jump, jumping in. So I'm kind of, providing different ways, structured ways, and also flexible ways to kind of engage with them and get them to, to talk and come out and be productive as much as they can during this time. So thank you for letting me talk. Great, thanks so much, Tom. Kelsey, you're the most patient person all day today. So I'll turn it over to you. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, so I wanted to show some examples of what's been going on in my classroom. So I'm actually also going to share my screen to show you guys some things. All right. Um, can you guys see the screen okay? Okay. Um, so my name is Kelsey Kapuczynski. I'm a math teacher at Weathersfield High School. Um, so the math department, when we first heard about distance, le distance learning, was definitely overwhelmed. How are we going to?
Can't hear you, Kelsey. Kind of pass out materials to students. Um, so for my assignments, right, I post, we have the even odd schedule at the high school. So we post every other day. Um, so when this first started, I wanted to try and kind of make my online classroom very similar to my regular classroom um, routine so that students would kind of have some normalcy in their lives and kind of not feel so out of place. So this is what a general, the directions would look like for an assignment. This was for my pre-calculus class. Um, so normally in our classroom, we would start off going over the homework um, from the last class. So that was their first step that you can see here. Um, look at the feedback that I provided to you on your assignment and I also post an answer key for them to look over all their solutions. Um, some days they'll have a concept check, um, some days they won't. Um, and then the third thing is to do the lesson. Um, so the lessons look a little bit different for my classes, which I'll talk about. And then on the bottom here, I, everything's posted in one place. All of the documents and resources that they need um, are all in one place for them. So in my classroom, normally if we were in the regular school building, I provide guided notes for my students, which you can see on the left-hand side. So I would print these and I would give them to my students um, and they would be able to follow along with the lesson. So I wanted to try and mimic that um, on my online classroom. So I used a program called Screencastify that captures your screen and anything that you're writing on it. So what I did was I modified the notes pages that I had to make them um, kind of usable for distance learning. And then I recorded myself doing these lessons. So it was very similar to what we would have done in class. And if students have access to a printer, I did give them the blank notes pages so they could follow along just like they would um, in a normal class period. So just show you like a really quick snippet of what this looks like. Minus 10 times 3x minus Right, so it's exactly like what I would have done um, in class. I can use color coding, which is really great um, for my co-taught class that I have um, for my special ed students. A lot of feedback I've gotten on the videos is that students actually really like them. A lot of them said um, that they like it better than our normal class because they're able to stop the video, try the next question on their own, and then keep playing, see how they did. Um, they can rewind if they don't understand it. own pace um, and do what they need to um, with that. So that's how most of the instruction has been delivered. Um, like Tom said, we are doing the asynchronous learning right now at the high school, so it's not um, possible to do a full class lesson. Um, so then within my Google um, assignment, right, I post the instructions a second time because sometimes they don't read them the first time. Um, so within the document though that I give them, it has links to everything that they need in case they don't want to click on them in the actual assignment on Google Classroom. So the first thing that I always do is post the answer key for the homework. Um, but I also like to make videos for them. So a lot of my students um, are working or taking care of siblings. I have all juniors and seniors. So a lot of them are not doing um, the work during the normal school hours. I'm amazed at the number of assignments I get between 12 and 3 a.m. Um, it blows my mind. So I'm not able to actually meet with them because um, I'm not awake at that time. So they email me questions and then I can make videos using Screencastify so they, they can still get that explanation, that um, verbal explanation um, and see me work out the problem step by step. So for example, this video, a student has, had asked me questions on 25 and 41. And then if I make an individual video for a student, I'll always make sure to upload it the next day for all students because um, there's probably another student out there who had the same question. Um, so that's always kind of their first step. And then um, this would be the video lesson link that I just showed you. Um, and then there's some type of assignment. So for this pre-calc assignment, um, I gave them some questions in the textbook to work on. Um, 
to kind of show what they learned from the video, apply their knowledge. Um, I did find access to an online ask questions in a digital format. Um, some of them a lot, my name's a lot kind of crazy. So some of them, their emails get lost in cyberspace because they can't spell it, even though I think it pops up, but whatever. Um, so they just list their problems here. They list either like a specific sentence or a number of a problem. And that's been really helpful for me to kind of plan my instruction and gauge, oh, okay, like half the class didn't understand number 25. I should probably make a video or address that um, again the next day. So I found that to be very helpful. Um, these are some examples of what students have uploaded. Um, the student on the left, um, a couple of my students have access to tablets, so they've been able to kind of download documents or just do their work right on their tablet, but most students are uploading pictures and I've um, kind of spent some time with them talking about how to take an appropriate picture. Um, I don't want to see everything that's in your bedroom when you take the picture. Um, I just want to see the document. So we've, um, I've shared some kind of scanner apps with them and um, it's been really helpful. Um, this is a sample of a concept checked. Another nice thing that Google Forms allows you to do is that if a student does get a question wrong, then I can input feedback immediately that will pop up. So when I create the form, um, like for the first question, how many solutions does the system have? If they get the question wrong, I can type in feedback so that the form automatically gives them that feedback of how to get the correct solution. So especially in the asynchronous environment, it's been really great to kind of have a way to give them instantaneous um, feedback. And this gives me, um, the Google form also grades um, the concept checks for me. So it's able to get a really quick snapshot of how, uh, snapshot of how my class is doing on an assignment. Um, so that's kind of the general format of my classes where they watch the instructional video and then do some type of assignment. My statistics class has lended itself more um, towards kind of some real world application questions. So for example, um, this day we had started learning about probability distributions and we started our unit on probability. So instead of giving them questions in the textbook, um, I gave them some questions on data that they would do on their own. So I asked them to find two coins in their house and I gave them a simulation for flipping coins in case they couldn't find coins at their house. Um, and they collected some data and then they, this was the blank form and they filled out a probability distribution. And then on the bottom here, they found different probabilities. So they were applying the knowledge that they learned in the video, but they were doing it um, with their own data collection. And I found that the lessons that I've done like this, students have been much more engaged in um, versus just giving them problems in the book to work on. So um, down here, this was a student's very scared about what was going to happen not having access to these, but um, Sarah was able to get all students access to this, um, which was great. It's actually the latest model of the calculators too, so it's even better than the ones that I have in my classroom. Um, so it's been extremely helpful. I've been able to make videos for students of how to do this in the calculator. Um, so it's been really awesome resource um, for us. Just one more example I wanted to share was in my Algebra 2 class, another just to keep students engaged, um, doing those assignments that are more kind of re related for them. Um, we were starting unit on exponential functions and we wanted to see kind of where were our students at with percentages before we started. How could we get them engaged and see where are you at percentages? ready for our exponentials unit um, and this was a student's example and she did a really great
so yeah, those are some examples of what we've been doing. We've been making it work the best we can. Stop sharing here. So yeah. Great, thank you so much, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. I have to tell all of you that this is the best part of my day, hearing all these stories come alive from your classrooms is uh, definitely the best part of my day. Not that it wasn't a good day, it was a good day, uh, but uh, these are great, uh, great presentations. So board members, um, any questions you have? Sally and everyone, I just have a comment. I am in awe. I really am of all the work you've done, the effort you've put into it. Um, um, I just have to say, we've come so far in just how many weeks? Eight to 10 weeks. Um, and we just have four more weeks to go, I believe. Um, please continue your incredible effort with these students. You really are doing them a tremendous service right now in this pandemic. Thank you. I like, <clears throat> I, great for, uh, presentations, um, everyone. And uh, I know I speak for a lot of the board members about the effort everyone's putting in on this. I, I got two sort of general questions that I, no one necessarily has to respond today because I know you're gonna, you've been feeding that information. I'm looking at the survey and what's coming back. And, you know, the survey, you can read it a di several different ways, the way it's written which you know shows there's a good chunk of people that are obviously under a lot of uh, stress um, both the teachers the paras uh, the parents kids etc and you know in your are you do you feel that you have everything you need uh, in terms of guidance and time to um, evaluate how these lesson plans are connecting. I mean, obviously the way we measure them, I assume we'll start to see it, you know, next year. Um, but do you, what's, I guess the, what's your one great frustration of not knowing how engaged or how much of the, this, this experience is, is, is taking with the kids. I, I see it and what you're saying and, and some of the responses, the way you set up these plans and forgive me for my, my lack of, uh, for my ignorance on how these things go. But to the average person trying to understand how we're making up, and if we ever can, between the obvious face-to-face -face classroom experience and the online experience, that, you know, I just, I guess my question is, what is the, the missing piece there that you feel most frustrated, if it is a frustration, um, on making the most of every day? I know you are making the most of every day, I'm not, I'm not articulating this like I want to, but I just like to know what kind of, um, you know, if, if you could have one ask or, or what one thing, is it more prep time? Is it uh, talking to other people about some of the things you hear and see in the kids' voices if they're having problems at home, not related to school, uh, that kind of thing? You start maybe at the elementary, then go secondary. You may have... Sure, whatever. <laughs> Emily? So I think the, at least the key for me is the first couple of weeks, I had to seriously realize that this is different learning. The students are learning. Um, and we talked about those 2020 skills that was mentioned. I mean, we're all learning an incredible amount. It might have been completely different than what I expected the learning to be when we started, but they are absolutely learning. And I think the more we realize that we're just investing in them as people, while using our curriculum to make sure we're connecting to them and make sure that they have some sort of normalcy, we're helping them get what they need and working on some of the problems we have in terms of connection or engagement. And we're working on those as a team. Um, in terms of the timing, I, I don't, I guess the advantage and disadvantage of working at home is you can pretty much work all night and all day. So, um, you know, I think us as educators want to work as hard as we can for as long as we can to make sure our students are getting what they need. Um, so that's definitely a positive and hard at the same time. But this is different learning. It's definitely not the same learning than we expected, but I would say there's a lot of skills that I think we're going to be better for in the future when we get back. 
Thank you. Who else wants to go? Go ahead, Tom. So I think that it's not so much frustration, and I think you put it very well the way you asked it. It's not frustration because I think for phase one of this whole unprecedented experience, I think we all did what we needed to do. And I think we erred on the side of good judgment for a lot of stuff. I think if distance learning were to continue, we would need a little bit more uh, of a way for kids to determine or parents to say they are able to participate, they aren't able to participate. And then from there, we have that flexibility built in. Um, I would have some optional office hours where I would help a few kids at a time. And then I decided I was going to try and make a required meet one day. And I said, but to make it flexible, I said, okay, you can meet this day, this day, or email me that you can't do it. And I had 90%, more than over 90% of the kids who were, were there. I mean, it was just, it was amazing that I got all these emails and stuff like that. So it's like, we're trying to find our way with it as well. And I think we find things that work in this new environment and we continue them. We find things that don't work as well in this environment and we go on it back to the chalkboard and we try and invent something new. So we're, we are, we are basically experimenting as we go, but we're learning very fast and applying what we learn. Anybody else? Go ahead, Siobhan. Okay, so you, you said for a wish list ask. So um, I think from where I'm sitting, um, integration is really a, a key if we're going to move forward with this for the future. Um, we've been so lucky that our tech department has helped us kind of create this online learning platform using a few different you know, pieces of technology or applications that weren't really designed to be a complete digital course. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, a, like online learning institutions have a, have a program where a child will log in and it's a little more intuitive for what they have to do for this course and that course. And it's a little easier to communicate with parents in a one-stop shop. Whereas now we're recording things in Google Classroom and then doing the same thing again over in PowerSchool to communicate, you know, participation levels or grades, depending on, on what level you're teaching um, with parents. And, and it's becoming a little tricky for teachers to, to manage so many different pieces. And so if, if we do move forward with this in, in the future, I'd rather be able to spend more time making some really meaningful um, experiences with kids and, and less time with the, that piece in the background, which is kind of an organizational piece for me. And, and I'm sure that, that our technology people would, would appreciate being able to focus their efforts a little more streamlined rather than, you know, these teachers are using this and these teachers are using that. And it, it just, I, I'd like to package things a little more. We've been talking about that at the building level at the middle school because, you know, it, it's different than at the elementary school where there's one teacher and maybe some specials. But for the secondary teachers, the parents who are trying to be as involved as they can be are having to communicate with different teachers who are using different you know, methods for communicating or different, um, different options for presenting their lesson materials. So I'd like to find a way to maybe package things a little more. I, it's been a really long day and I don't think that I am really articulating the point that, I, uh, that I'm trying no, to make. I think, but you, I think you are, I think you are. I, think, I get what you're saying. We can talk more about it later, but I get what you're saying. Thank you. Didi? Okay, so, um, so for me, <laughs> The challenge of this, I think Emily said it well, we could work 24 hours a day. Um, I can tell you that there are days that I've gone to bed at 2.30 in the morning and been back in the same chair at this desk at 6.30 in the morning and been here until eight o'clock at night. Um, that's not a complaint. I do that out of the way I want to serve my students. But on the other hand, it is a little bit unfair to my family. And the, the challenge is because um, what I'm learning and what I think is so important to the kids is that they still want their teachers. These relationships that we've built are part of what makes these kids the young humans they get to be as they grow up. And so 
um, I, the math lessons which are online, I now create the math lesson myself, but it takes me an hour to create the smart notebook slides because it needs to be seamless to fit into a smaller time frame for me to be able to teach. And I teach it through Google Meet and record myself alone in the meeting, presenting my smart notebook for my laptop. The kids love it, but I would love to do that in Readers and Writers Workshop. The problem is, is that in order to record all of those lessons, I'm teaching school without being in school. Then when the lessons post for students to watch, I'm online to respond to their commentary and their questions. And again, not a complaint. That's what they need and want, and that's how they're learning, and I want them to have that. The challenge is, is that if I could go live, like it's reading time, anybody that's available log into reading at 9.30, Mrs. Mahoney's doing her mini lesson live, I can't record that lesson. If I could teach it live and record it, then I could post it for my asynchronous learners later instead of teaching it twice or being present for it twice. So it's really a matter of trying to figure out how to balance that time. And I don't know if that, if that means that I need more prep time or I need to, I don't know, prep less and fly free more. But I, what I learned also was that when I flew freely and kind of went off the cuff a little bit, those videos were longer and everything needs to be concise. So part of it's my own learning curve and I've certainly gotten better and more efficient, but the kids keep asking. Like my morning message is typed. I used to greet them every morning, talk to them, it's typed. But the kids said, Mrs. Mahoney, we miss you in the morning. So after I type it, I audio tape it. The message comes up typed, but they can click on the link to hear me. It's just another time factor. I'm happy to do it for the kids, but it's a time factor. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, I, you know, I have a question for Didi and Christina, the elementary teachers. Um, as we move forward, how are you going to, I know it's a pass-fail setup everywhere, how are we going to do, and I'm thinking ahead, class list and making sure that next year's classes, whether they're online with this distance learning or in the schools, if we have those equitable classrooms that we've always worked so hard for. That was a conversation that we just started today between my colleagues and I, as we start preparing uh, actually tomorrow to start our class placements. And um, as we know at the elementary level, it's extremely time consuming that we make sure that every class is equitable. Um, and so being that we are, we haven't really had, you know, up to date formal assessments to go off of, um, you know, I really need to think of the student as a whole and where we've left off and what I've seen during this time uh, to be able to make mindful choices moving forward for all the kids. Um, with that said, we do have some students who have not been engaged with um, distance learning. So again, you know, considering what I saw leading up to March 13th um, and utilizing that information to make the best choices possible, you know, creating equitable um, classes for September and hopefully, um, you know, just making sure we're utilizing everything possible. And I would piggyback on that and say that we've had started Started these discussions in our building about two weeks ago um, and we kind of created um, Glenn set up this rating scale where we kind of rate kids based on their need in the classroom meaning um, in terms of level of instruction who's the kid that you're least worried about and who are the kids you're most worried about and it was interesting when I kind of organized that you know you really could say three groups but really when I put the kids in an order the thing that might surprise most people is my special ed students were not the kids that necessarily needed the most help. Um, depending on disability, depending on parent support, depending on their relationship with their paraprofessional, some of my highest flyers right now, the kids that turn in every assignment on time, send pics. I have one student who shares all of his work with me online and in the little box where he's supposed to tell me what he wants me to do, he just writes, I love you. And that's how everything comes through and he's a high flyer so I think in terms of equity 
we're all going to do the best that we can with what we have. And I, and I think, Bobby, you know this from your own experience, that no matter how hard teachers try to create those equitable classrooms, there are some years you walk in your room and you say, what were they thinking to put these kids together? But you show up and you look at those beautiful faces and you do the best you can. And you know what? When June rolls around, you look back and you go, oh my gosh, look how much they've grown. So there's a part of me that cares. And there's another part of me that says in the big scheme of life, that's a small piece. Kids are going to show up and the rock stars that you've heard present tonight are going to teach them and, and we're going to be okay. And I think we've proven that right now. I do too. Thank you, Dee Dee. Thank you, Christina. Kelly, go ahead. Oh, I just realized my face is bright red. This pregnancy is killing me. Um, <laughs> so just don't look at the, the video. I have a quick comment real quick. Um, that, and I, I say this all the time, but I want to reiterate what, what strikes me so much working in kind of a financial private specs um, sector is the dedicate. I don't see in my work the kind of dedication that I see on these calls. Um, I, I, some of you, I have two small children at Hanmer and these teachers, you guys are working, you know, around the clock. If you come to Aetna and you look at a parking lot at four o'clock, it's empty. Um, you guys are working an insane amount and I kind of see this double work that you guys have to do with videoing and then presenting and I just am I'm in awe of your dedication I'm completely impressed with how quickly you've rolled this out and how you are really trying to reach all of your students what I would love for you guys to do is truly take this weekend and unplug and take some time for yourself because I can't even imagine you know doing what I do and having kids and you know, I get to log off and it seems like you guys never do. So I appreciate so much your efforts and your dedication, but um, make sure to take some time for yourself too, because God bless you. I'm tired just listening to your stories. So thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Dee Dee. Any other questions, comments? Real quick. Um, so what do we, I guess the other open-ended open question is um, the 15% that jumps out of people that aren't uh, engaged on online learning. And I guess I'm not looking for an answer here, but the question is going to come up is I know some of those issues are technologically driven. So the last time we were on this call, they said that number sort of mirrors the challenges that we face with in the classroom under any circumstances but just as a general comment are we using in other words we have these issues in the classroom that's one thing this is a different form of learning obviously so how does that even though it's the same number the same problem what are we doing on that level or what are we trying to do i guess is the question is it technology? Is it getting people wired up? Is it uh, the function of, of dysfunction? I don't, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there to say it's still there. People could, might say, well, if they're home, why is it harder to reach them in a, than in a classroom? I, I'm just spitballing there, so go ahead. So I think the um, equity question you asked, Chris, I think is a really important one that we have to remember. Well, we have a lot of great success stories. Um, we do continue and we did also when we were in the building uh, and out of the building um, to ensure that all our learners, every single learner within Wethersfield Public Schools is receiving that high um, quality education. Um, and so there are students that um, are not engaged and for a variety of reasons. And when Michael and I do meetings with principals and we um, talk about what their engagement, we call engagement teamwork um, and students that um, have um, kind of ri risen to the, the triage level of uh, really um, having multiple service providers work with the family, with the student. Um, one of the things I can tell you is the schools and the support engagement teams know those students well. They know about the family, they know the parents, they've had conversations, know about the student, and they know about the story behind um, each one of those families. Um, and there's a wide variety of um, stressors and reasons um, very few, I think, is really technology um, um, 
um, and, and even uh, food at this point. Um, I think the district has been very, very creative in trying to break down the barriers with technology. Um, hardest for our youngest, youngest learners, again, because of um, you know, parental support. Um, and we're looking to make some improvements in that for next year. Um, we have um, language barriers and we have, you know, as you've heard today, um, even with our staff members, we have uh, people that are working and both parents are working and siblings taking care of uh, younger siblings. Um, so I think there's a wide variety and I think there's also a lot of success stories. There's been some success stories of students that have been engaged, um, but um, there are, I think that's probably the most frustrating and the hardest part for all our educators and our administrators is continue to try and uh, because in our hearts, we want every student to be engaged in the process. And it is so hard when we can't get it to work and can't get it to work and can't get it to work. And I think that is probably um, what I hear the most frustrating piece for all our educators um, because we want 100% of our students to come um, to the table to work and collaborate with us. So we continue to work on that. Um, to can get strategies, networking with other pieces um, and other towns and, and ideas but that continues to be a struggle. I think one of the things I heard tonight is the importance of relationships, and that really is important. Um, we're talking a little bit about, you know, the possibility of distance learning 2.0 in um, effect next year, and what you heard a lot today is, you know, the theme of relationships and building relationships with students next year as they enter a new school year, whether we're in the classrooms or, or in distance learning, and really building those relationships and doing that creatively, um, that will be different next year should we start in distance learning. Yeah, I didn't want to imply that we aren't working extra hard and, and doing that. I just thought I'd mention just because, you know, you look at the numbers and that number's there. And we are much better off than many school districts in the area. I realize that. I'm, I'm personally very proud of the effort everyone's doing here. And I just want to thank everyone. I've learned a lot tonight. Um, and I hope to learn I hope more to learn in the more. weeks and uh, certainly open to any suggestions, ideas to the board members and Sally about what we can learn over these next few weeks, how we can prepare during the summer, whatever hand we're dealt, uh, whether we're here in the classroom, whether we're not, whether we're in the classroom to start and somehow we may have to be forced out of the classroom, all these things I know Mike and his team are working on. Uh, there are many, um, unknowns as they say and known knowns i won't go into that whole one-liner but uh i i really want to thank everyone for the effort you guys are putting into i have heard it from many parents in my own little neighborhood here but the effort the teachers are making around the clock i just want you to know that um so uh um, thank you all again for that is, sally is there anything else we need to cover tonight or can we no i i just to want to echo out? that i I think our teachers, you know, I think um, it's really inspirational to me when I hear um, stories and the things they've shared tonight and, and um, the opportunities I get to hear, it's inspiration. But I'm also really impressed with, um, you know, the growth mindset of the learner community and our staff has really embraced. Um, we all will learn this together and that really is, we're all moving forward um, in amazing ways. And I think we've all learned some things, we students and staff, we never thought we would learn when we started this. Um, and so our trajectory of what we've learned, I think is a little bit different, but I think there's also immense amount of learning going on. So thank you all for coming. I uh, appreciate your time. I know you're really busy. Um, Dee Dee, go to bed, do not stay up now. Um, and I think we can call for an adjournment or is there any, I guess, is there any other business first? Uh, oh, Mike? Michael? Yes, I just wanna wrap up so that everybody can either go eat dinner or ha head up for bed or knowing our teachers as well as we know our teachers, get back to planning. I just wanna wrap this up by, by putting this all in perspective. And I want you to think back to the middle part of March when the state first announced that we were gonna close. And the state talked about the fact that they did not want us to do distance learning. They wanted us just to add the days on to the end of the calendar. We did not go in that direction. We developed a team of teacher leaders and administrators that developed a distance learning program, that implemented that distance learning program. We rolled out 1,100 Chromebooks to kids in grades three through six. We have still continued to roll out devices all the way down to kindergarten for those that need them. We have mailed devices to our open choice students so that they have access. We have thought outside of the box and we have been innovative for the past eight weeks. 
And all I can say is thank you for the tireless work and the efforts that you have put into making sure that our kids are getting the best possible education they can. So I am proud and honored to be working with all of you. I thank you for your efforts and your innovation and doing the best that you can for our kids. So with that, chair of this committee, Mr. Healy. Uh, just one final thing. Someone, and I can't, I wish I could give you the right salutation, said something today that was talking about, we have to step up the magic. I thought that was a great line. Uh, what we're doing is stepping up the magic. Maybe we can make that our next bumper sticker. Uh, for the high for the school sounds system. good but sounds anyway good. listen i uh we are adjourned thank you again we'll be taking um, this measure and i hope you all have at least a somewhat relaxing weekend ahead you've all earned it 10 times over so thank you have a good night everyone thank you everyone good night